Good morning, everyone. Okay, starting with the land acknowledgement, we acknowledge and pay tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans is a continuation of an indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River, known for thousands of years as Wilbancha. Native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain an inseparable part of our local culture. With gratitude and honor, we acknowledge the indigenous, the indigenous nations that have lived and continue to thrive here. Welcome, everyone. My name is Leah LaRue. I'm the program coordinator for the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, which is housed in Tulane University's School of Liberal Arts. Thank you for joining us for the sixth iteration of this annual event, which is part of an ongoing Center for the Gulf South series called Women in Movement. The Women in Movement series is designed to collectively engage women scholars and artists from across the Gulf South region to take part in discourse about place, performance, and the socio-political issues that transform their bodies, art, language, and greater community. I am so excited to learn from this incredible group of panelists today as they are amongst the trailblazers of the deeply rooted legacy and artistic culture of black women in New Orleans and beyond. <clears throat> As an introduction, the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South supports the understanding of New Orleans and the Gulf South region and this region's relationship to the world. Through place-based research, fellowships, and programming that bridges the academic and public, we aim to create dynamic and transdisciplinary settings that foster cultural and planetary health. As our executive director says, all of our programming is based on the belief that the more we understand where we are, the more fully we can engage in our democracy and collective destiny. We welcome you to sign up for our monthly newsletter and to join us for upcoming programming. On March 1st through 2nd here on campus, we're co-hosting Gulf Coast Connections with Rice University's Center for Environmental Studies to bring together artists, scholars, and activists from across the Gulf South. And on March 19th, we'll be out on the Lafitte Corridor for our next Anthroposonic event, featuring a live broadcast by Bulbancha Liberation Radio at the Nani Bulbancha Mound. Center for the Gulf South wants to thank the Department of Theater and Dance, the Africana Studies Program, and the Velasquez of Tulane University Libraries, Douglas Miller and Brittany Fowler of the School of Liberal Arts Communications team, the NOCGS Executive Secretary Regina Cairns, and our student worker, Environmental Studies major, Ruby Kim. And we want to honor our Assistant Director, Dr. Denise Frazier, and Lauren Turner, who have long been instrumental in co-creating this series. Finally, we extend a special thanks to the Assistant Professor of Theater, Dr. John Ray Proctor, of the Department of Theater and Dance and the Africana Studies Program. We are so grateful to have partnered with such an amazing leader and organizer for a sixth year on the African American Woman Affecting the Arts in New Orleans event series. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you panelists for being here. Thank you Lakeisha as our moderator for being here. Thank you Rebecca Snedeker for partnering with me in this endeavor for six years in a row. Uh, and thank you students for being here. I wanna take just a moment to say that, I wanna explain this to the panelists. Many of them are students and some of them have classes after this. So if we notice, notice an exit, please don't let that throw you. They just have places to be. Um, and without further ado, uh, this, this event began because I'm a transplant to New Orleans. And as a transplant, I was really curious about what the people here who are making art outside of Tulane University are doing. So six years ago, uh, Rebecca and I had this conversation and we thought about inviting the artists, the art makers in this city into this space and having a conversation about what it's like to make, as black women, what it's like to make art in this city. Without further ado, our moderator this afternoon or this morning is Lakeisha, Lakeisha Glover. Lakeisha is a multi-talented actress with a passion for storytelling that spans across stage, film, and television. She's worked at the St. Louis Black Repertory Theater Company, most recently on a production of Dontrell, Who Kissed the Sea. Uh, her stage repertoire includes notable performances in Seven Guitars, uh, String with No Dream Deferred, Small Craft Warning with the Tennessee Williams Theater Company, which is a local theater company, and Lakeisha's prowess extends to the realm of film and television, where she has brought her characters to life with depth and authenticity. Her credits include The Adulterer, Regret, Disney's show Saturdays, Saturdays, uh, Leverage, uh, the leverage, the new leverage, the redemption, and secrets of sulfur springs and killing it. Without further ado, Lakeisha Glover. 
Wow, that sounds different when you hear it, right? <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I am honored to be sitting here with these beautiful, talented ladies on this stage. And the hardest part was how do I sum up your bios, okay? Because I heard we only got a certain amount of time, so I can't say everything, but I do want to point out the most important things, and when we come to you, I would like for you to let them know more about what you're doing. We have Nyla Jefferson. Let's give her a round of applause. She is a New Orleans-born filmmaker, uh, intrigued and inspired by the human spirit. She currently, um, and I saw you at the New Orleans Film Festival for her most recent work, Commuted. Let's give her a round of applause. It won New Orleans Best Film Festival uh, and Best Documentary, correct? Best Documentary. Best Documentary? <laughs> yes, and we have Donna Duplouche. Did I say it right? She, she is a theater, stage, and film actress. Uh, you have seen her in um, so many different movies around here. She is, let me go through it. Um, you see her, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Uh, the Dallas Buyers Club, uh, Treme, a regular, and um, Queen Sugar as well, and other projects. And she has coming out on Valentine's Day Catch. She plays Lisa Frankenstein as Principal Buckley. All right, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> India King Robbins is a writer, arts administrator, theater artist, and educator commit committed to affirming black women and youth through arts and advocacy. Very good, and she works for a nonprofit, Novak. Um, we have Nicole Collins, which is a film, what film, theater story maker, uh, actor, media personality from Louisiana. <laughs> she also just recently left um, Canada from her, which film? Oh, but you know, I know these ladies, so I'm sorry I'm adding to it. Um, <laughs> She has um, recently a perf uh, won the National Performance Network Take Notice Fund, as well as a Cultural War Performance Production Lab's Next Up Artist Award. Um, so many other things. She has a nonprofit in which she's working with the youth, young girls, which is very influential. She's very much involved in the community in New Orleans. And so, thank you, I had to round it up. They, these ladies are phenomenal. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it, all right? Being black women, filmmakers, storytellers in New Orleans, let's talk about how the film and media industry in New Orleans has been with you all and your relationship with it. How did you start as a black woman in New Orleans with film? Um, so for me, hi everybody. I started as, a, as an actor. So when I moved to New Orleans, I moved in 2005 from Alexandria, Louisiana, which is middle of the state. And so, you know what, actually I started as a radio personality. I went to Dillard University. I interned for Clear Channel at the time, which is now iHeartMedia, uh, Q93. And I worked long, long hours without getting paid to prove that I could be on air because I was told I was too country to be on air. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get my voice together. Um, Anywho, so I started in radio, and then from radio, I began to be serious about acting. Then in that position, had a child, uh, and then my acting started to, to blossom, and then the acting just stopped. I was booking roles, I had a recur on Treme, I had a role in 12 Years a Slave, I was doing different things, and then nothing. And it was just like, wait, what's happening? I thought I was on the upscale, I thought I was about to go to Hollywood, I thought I was about to make it big, and it was like, nope. Everything's done, you're done. And so uh, that's what it felt like. So I had, uh, thankfully, a group of friends around me who are writers and, and performers and people taking matters into their own hands who encouraged me to leverage um, the radio station and, and my resources that I have in New Orleans to create my own film, write my own story. Um, and so I did just that. And once I did it the one time, I was like, ooh, I like this. I like being in charge. I like writing my own stories. I like leading. Um, and so I just decided to do more and more and more of that. The first things were horrible, um, things I wouldn't ever want you to see. Um, <laughs> because I didn't go to film school. I learned along the way, I, you know, and thankfully had people like Naila who, who met up with me in the beginning, who gave me, uh, you know, advice and encouragement. Um, 
But then all of a sudden it just started getting better and better and better and better. And now it's like, oh, you're winning awards. Oh, you're really good at this. Oh, you know what you're doing now. And now, you know, you're on boards and stuff. And so, you know, it gets better. So that has been my experience as a filmmaker here in New Orleans. And every now and then I got to remind folks, I act too. <laughs> um, I started my journey in New Orleans as an educator. Um, I worked at a middle school and primarily with students with special needs. And I found that they were not being as successful because they didn't have enough creative outlets. So they might be struggling in math and science, but be very great at visual art or theater. And so I spent a lot of energy and time trying to make sure that the school had resources to provide enrichment for the students. And when I saw that it wasn't a priority, um, in my frustration, I decided to get um, a master's degree. <laughs> So just pay for a master's degree. Um, while I was still in education, while I was still teaching, I started a master's program that was focused on arts administration, which is essentially um, my thought was to figure out how to connect schools, community, um, and artists together, focused in a way to be. You, you, to focus on providing equitable access to arts enrichment. And so I transitioned out of working in schools and started to work in arts organizations, helping them to think about how to advance their educational programming and to, more, to be more connected to schools. Um, and so I was approached um, by the executive director of New Orleans Video Access Center while I was working um, in another arts administrative role about being the executive director of New Orleans um, Video Access Center. And although I understood essentially how to run an arts organization, I didn't know if working at a filmmaking organization made sense because I wasn't a filmmaker by trade. But um, I thought more about it and really valued the fact that Novak focused on education, opportunities, and resources to community people to help them get access to working and excelling as filmmakers. And so that's kind of how I started. I've been at Novak for over four years now, and we primarily help community people get access to opportunities. So folks like Nicole years ago who might have wanted to start a film but never had access to education could come to Novak and get classes or training to work in the film industry or make their own film. And so that's what I do now. Um, I haven't made a film yet. I hope to make one in 2024. I might be reaching out to y'all for some help. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm excited and I, I feel like I sit as like a producer sometimes helping make sure that Novak has the resources to make films and that community people have the resources to make their films and also just essentially an, ar uh, an architect of, I don't know, like programming and things. So yeah, do stuff. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I started here, of course, uh, in my backyard doing plays, and I always loved the arts, I always loved performing. From there, um, went through high school performing, I went to UNO for one semester, and I decided I need to get out of New Orleans. So I went to uh, Virginia, George Mason, studied and became a uh, theater major there, performed there, and then I would thought I was going to be a dancer, so I was focusing on dance. I got to perform with a dance company, I got with a New York dance company in their repertory and performed with them, and then I moved to New York when I got with this dance company, and I said, I gotta go back to my roots, went back to studying theater after a year of partying, I said, I'm doing nothing. <laughs> I went to William Esper, I heard about them, and I went there for two and a half years. After that, I studied with the incredible Wynne Hammond, who has since passed away. Um, and from there, I met incredible Broadway theater actors. So I did my first off-Broadway shows, and then I got an agent, and then 9-11 uh, happened. I was doing commercials. I was like, I got to go. Went to L.A., did a little work there, and I was going crazy. And I said, okay, I'm going to come home because the trades, you know, the trades, variety, Hollywood reporter. Started talking about New Orleans, sniffing New Orleans, the incentives. So I moved home. I said I would be a big fish in a small pond and started working immediately. Then of course Katrina happened, <laughs> a year of my life disappeared, and then I came back home and I just started working since then. There've been a lot of dry periods like last year, we know the strike, but since then I've been working consistently and become like a local, like Nicole um, and India, um, a, a person that is a go-to actor. So I'm still working on my craft and Still hoping one day I can do my own film. I've actually worked with this incredible, amazing filmmaker in a short, and it was an amazing experience, and I loved it. And look up her resume, she's incredible. So that's it.
Hi everyone. Um, so I kind of my story is kind of like uh, bloom where you're planted, right? That's what they say. So, born and raised in New Orleans, I went to school in Boston, and I always thought I would live in New York or LA. I never thought I'd be in New Orleans. Like, I have uh, three older sisters, and they all thought that they would be here, and they're not here. I'm the only one that's still here, and it's it's. It was odd thinking about it back then because the industry wasn't as big. Um, I came back home in 2007. I was living in New York. I was working for Lee Daniels, and he decided to downsize his office. And instead of staying on as his personal assistant, because I just knew I couldn't take it, uh, right? <laughs> you know, well, I didn't say that, but you know. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I just I knew I couldn't be his personal assistant and be close to him every day. God bless. Um, so I decided to come home and take care of myself, but also, you know, try and work here. And the first job that I got was at, um, I don't know if you all have ever heard of Energized Entertainment. They were producing, the, no, they were a video game company. They were producing the first black uh, college football video game, and they wanted um, a, a documentary about HBCUs, a company that released. Um, so I was hired to do that, and I became like a big fish in a small pond because there was so little uh, people, especially in, doc in uh, Baton Rouge, with documentary experience at the time. This is, like I said, 2007. And so I'm working there, and that's when I realized, oh, I can direct. Because before that, I didn't really know where I was going to land. I knew I wanted to be in film and television. I figured I'd write, produce. But that's when I was really able to kind of like steer a ship. And I realized I could do it. I worked with two men who were supposed to edit for me. They wouldn't listen to me. I learned how to edit. Um, but I just I figured it all out on my own there. And then um, eventually that company ran out of money and stopped paying me. In 2010, the BP oil spill happened, and I said, well, I can work for myself for free. And um, for four years, I documented um, the fishermen on, in Point of La Hache, Louisiana, and made the film Vanishing Pearls. And so that's what really set me up as a di uh, documentary director, as a director, period. Um, that was my very first film, and since then, I can't believe it's been 10 years. It, it was released in 2014. Since then, we've been rolling, and the film Plaquemines that Donna uh, was in, that was my very first fiction film. It was very much influenced by um, the experience that the Fisher families were going through uh, in Point of La Hache after the BP oil spill. But um, since then, I've made uh, two other documentaries, long form. I've made a couple of shorts. Um, one is Danielle Luna, Supermodel, um, which, came out, <laughs> which came out in 2023, and then Commuted, which will be out uh, in April. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, again, I never thought I would be here, but in the time since I've been home, it's just incredible to see how much the independent film community has really grown. You know, people were talking about the bigger films coming to New Orleans, but um, in, in the time that I've been here, it, the, I think the independent film community has really grown, especially black filmmakers, because you didn't see as many as you do now. So, and I know that's because of Novak, places mm -hmm. like that, um, that help foster this type of talent. So thank you, India, for all that you do. Yeah, thank you, India. <laughs> You're doing good work. So my next question, as a black woman filmmakers in New Orleans, how has it been with, um, has it been difficult finding funding and grants for your projects? And India, this is also um, a question that you can answer. <laughs> well, well, I would be interested in hearing y'all's opinions as independent mm -hmm. filmmakers. I grant raise for an organization that has to pay people, has to do multiple levels of programming, and a part of what we do is help people make films, and we help people get trained to work in the film industry. So um, we help people get jobs to be below the line talent, behind the camera talent. So a lot of entry level positions like production assistant, production coordinator, or production office before you become coordinator. But we're also trying to get people more craft specific positions like working um, as a costume designer, working as a production designer. And it's really hard to get people to get those jobs without first the education and then more opportunities to practice their skills. So how do we get money for it? Well, you can't do the programming without the money and you can't get the money without the programming. And so it is, 
it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, we luckily have been in a situation where we have um, a three-year grant to do workforce training. This is a big deal, y'all. A three-year grant to do workforce training across Louisiana. And so we're doing training in New Orleans, Baton Rouge. We're also going to go to Shreveport. Um, hopefully by the end of this year, we do some training that's virtual so people across the state have access to it. Uh, but that, um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of uh, like knows you you have to figure out how to tell the story about what it is that you're trying to do and the impact that you're trying to make so sometimes it's almost like making a film but writing a script about who you are and selling it like you have to pitch it and I'm pitching all the time like at an event in an elevator or wherever I am I'm trying to get somebody to understand why they need to support our organization and grants are not easy to get because also there are so many organizations in New Orleans and in Louisiana and we're fighting for the same money unfortunately so you know there might be, you know, the, the city has been doing more to give us money, like New Orleans Culture and Tourism um, Grant is an excellent opportunity for local independent filmmakers and organizations. Um, and that money comes from tourism. So there's a percentage of tax that's taken off of like the hotel industry, um, for example, that is put up and then put back into the community. And we need more of that. Like the culture is why people come here. So culture bearers and cultural practitioners should be getting the money. Um, but a lot of it is about can you make the argument and can you prove it? And sometimes people believe you and sometimes they don't. Uh, so it takes also creating various streams of income, not just depending on grants, but having earned income opportunities, selling other services, and also fundraising, having events. It's it's a variety of things that you have to do in order to sustain the work. And I know as independent filmmakers, many people start their 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 films and you know do them piece by piece as they can. And I know you you spoke about this the other day with your film. Like it takes years sometimes for people to finish films to get the money to do it. And sometimes you have to do a little bit and have a proof of concept, sell that, pitch that, revise that, improve it, and sell it, pitch it again, you know? Um, so, yeah. You wanna? Uh, I you wanna I mean, not to put you on. No, 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 no. I just, I know that time, and I know we have, uh, but just to, because you went over the grant portion of it, I will say this too. Um, and you said the no portion of it, you're gonna have a lot of no's. No's is a part of it. Um, I'm gonna put on my spiritual hat here. My spiritual hat says, you do the work, you create the projects. It's gonna come, it's gonna come. It may not come tomorrow or next week, but you keep working towards your project, it'll come. Realistically, that may be saying, hey mom, <laughs> Uh, I got this film I want to do. Can you give me $5,000 for the first one, right? Um, or it may be working a little bit more or waiting a tax time or refund or, or whatever your, uh, for school. What, what do you call that? Refund check. That's a refund check. Yeah, maybe you know, if you're in school. It's been a while. I don't know. Well, listen, uh, but, but I'm just saying if you get it, you know, sometimes you just have to use the resources in front of you in order to get your work made. The great thing that I find, and Naila, if you want to, you can chime in on that. I usually do narrative filmmaking. Um, so that's, you know, writing the script, having the characters. But I find that whenever you do documentary filmmaking, you can do a little bit more without the need to have so much money up front. But I mean, that's something that I can definitely talk about a little bit more. Um, but as far as the overall question about money, there is money out there. Um, for sure. And the more you put yourself out there, the more that you continue to do the work and people see you and people believe in you. A lot of times they want to know what's your track record? What are you able to do? What are you capable of doing? That's why they want to know what have you done before? And it's difficult because if you haven't done anything before, it's like, I need my chance. I need my chance. So you can see. Um, but it's, it's, it's out there and I don't want the money part to ever discourage anyone listening from putting the first foot forward to getting it done. Um, as far as the grants, um, I think I've been successful with one grant locally, and that was in 2016, the Create Louisiana grant is how we were able to make plaque amends. Um, but as far as that goes, I mean, India, you're, you're right. There's, there's only so much money, and there's way more talent than there is money that can support that talent. Um, but, you know, shout out to the administration for, for uh, creating the New Orleans, what is it, New Orleans Culture and Tourism? Fund, yeah, I'm gonna, 
Yeah, I'm gonna apply in May because I have yeah, a project. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I am, and uh, apparently, yeah, because I know it's like you gotta. There's so many applications going in. If you're not one of those first, if right, if you're not one of those first people to put in your application, it, it ain't happening. Um, and so, you know, I think New Orleans Film Society does what they can to support filmmakers, but we definitely need more help. Um, at least within within my field. I think we definitely need more help to get these projects done. Um, it's only that one film back in 2016 that I think got local support. Any other grants that I've got have not been from within Louisiana um, or New Orleans. And congratulations to the chicken and egg. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, chicken and egg. I mean, a, a great organization. They support women and non-binary filmmakers. And what they did is they said, okay, you're mid-career, you need a break. And so they, they, they give people $50,000 unrestricted. Yes. Praise God. I can chill out this year. Uh, filmmaker Kyoko McRae is now working for Chicken and Egg. She moved to New York. So you have that connection. All right, I want to know what's been your inspiration and your creative process when it comes to the storytelling that you're doing. Can we start with you, Naila? Um, I was thinking about this this morning. I think a lot of people are inspired by place. Um, and as I you know, admitted a little while ago, I never thought I'd be in New Orleans. So I can't say that I was inspired by place, not that you know where we live isn't special and, and inspirational, but I'm more inspired by people. I find people incredibly interesting. So everyone that I've done a documentary on, they usually have something within, within them that I wish I had in myself. So like Byron Ancolade, who um, was the president of the Louisiana Oystermen's Association and really put his community on his back and said, you will not forget about us, you will pay us fairly. Um, we're going to use this documentary to state our case, and that's exactly what he did. And um, he brought it to uh, mediation and was able to get more uh, a bigger claims payout. Um, people like that, people like Danielle Luna, who is one of one. I mean, she is probably the most fascinating person I've ever read about, uh, learned about, probably will ever make a film about. Um, but this is a woman who grew up in the 60s, and a black woman in Detroit, and refused to box herself in and decided for herself at the age of 14, I'm gonna change my name and say I'm from the moon. And this is how I'm gonna walk out my life, right? Right? Um, so people like that. So like I said, just I find people incredibly fascinating. I'm not the most extroverted person, but I can sit down and talk to anybody and learn your story. Um, and then that inspires me to tell stories. Um, as far as a performer? Um, I always uh, go back to my roots. If ever I'm in um, a, a film or even on stage, I always try to relate whatever I'm trying to portray um, back to a specific story that relates to me. Um, it, I generally, it's, it's a, I'm portraying a character, but I take from my own personal experiences. Um, I love to hear more about uh, black storytelling especially women, um, like Diane Luna. She was like the first black supermodel that no one's really ever heard of, but you would see her in magazines and she was stunning, you know, and I didn't know anything about her story. But um, yeah, that, that's basically how I proceed whenever I am um, cast in a project. And, you know, try not to second guess why I'm in this project, because that can happen. You know, like, why did I get this role? Oh, I can fit the clothes. Oh, I can, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, that's basically how I proceed. Yeah. Speaking as somebody who helps people get access to resources to make films, I, I'm inspired by people getting the power. Um, and so I think a lot about preserving the culture and helping people document their own lives. I'm a documenter by nature. I write down everything. I literally write to survive. Um, I believe in taking pictures and holding on to your family stories. And I find that a lot of artists and creative people are able to highlight their work through somebody else's gaze. And, you know, other artists document these um, cultural practices and are highlighted and paid when the artists and the culture themselves don't get it. And so for me, I'm most inspired by giving people power and helping people to document themselves, helping people to develop the skill and practice to make their own work, to 
preserve it, to sell it, to do whatever it is that they want to do with it so that they are not dependent on others to tell their stories. So my inspiration is actually at a bit of a crossroads right now. I'm like Britney Spears. Y'all remember that movie, Crossroads? <laughs> so that's where I'm at um, with it. So I grew up in central Louisiana, so Alexandria. I don't know if we have any 318s in the house, but I'll be the lone wolf. Um, and I grew up Catholic. I grew up black Catholic. Um, I don't necessarily uh, subscribe to Catholicism anymore. However, being a Catholic woman growing up has been was really interesting the whole process of going to confession and how it affects your sexuality and um, all of the many things right and so for the longest my inspiration was about black women's liberation breaking free from uh, the confinements of what you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to act and just allowing people to have the personal freedom to live their lives the way that they want to. And that was um, a lot of the themes in the films that I created. So when I say my inspiration is now at a crossroads, um, I have been thrown into the realm of politics. Um, I'm not gonna say against my will because I said yes, uh, but I had left radio for a while and uh, I got a call to get back into it. I said no two times. And then they came back like, we really want you. And I said, okay. I did, you know, I consulted with who I needed to consult it with and, and it, was, it came back like, yes, do this. And so I did it and I'm doing it. And it's, now I feel like my inspiration is now the healing between black men and black women um, and making sure that we understand that there is no hatred that there is love, but there is a healing aspect that needs to, to go into it. And so that is what I am focused on and that is what I am committed to doing. Also, likewise, up at the Capitol right now, there is a war going on for the rights of our people, our, our men and women incarceration crime bills. That is what's on the line, nothing to prevent things from happening, nothing about childcare, nothing about education, nothing about healthcare, nothing about economy, nothing about infrastructure. It's all about locking away people and making a dollar off of the backs of black men and women in the incarceration system, because let's be honest, that's, that's who they're gonna make the money off of, right? And so that also inspires me to create, because as a creator, we have to use, I believe, our voices, talents, and resources in order to allow people to know, hey, this is what's going on. We won't stand for that. You can't do this to us. And so this is now where I'm saying the crossroads is at, is being more of a po political, um, but then also um, familial uh, inspiration. So I don't think I'm gonna be Angela Davis, but definitely using my voice to, to let people know what's going on and be more aware. So that leads me to my next question. Um, do you find yourself representing all the black womanhood? And if so, do you find that as a burden or a story that you um, you love to tell, whether you're performing or you know behind the scene or in front of the cameras? How does that feel? I do not represent all black women because that's saying that all black women are one way. Mm -hmm. And we are not. We all have our own different experiences. Um, you know, we, we have our different personalities, individuality. Now, what I do, what I will say, and this is something that I've decided, I can't say every black woman has to be this way, but what I've decided to do as a creator and as a black woman creator is say that I'm going to help other black women. I'm going to be a resource for other black women. Um, I'm committed to helping as many black women as will allow me to, um, and to learn from as many black women as I can, um, to tell as many stories, especially of elderly black women and their experiences. Um, and honestly, I feel like it's a badge of honor to take on that and not a burden. Um, I think it becomes a burden when you feel like you have to represent every single black woman um, you know, I am every woman. I, I'm not gonna sing it for y'all, cause trust me, y'all don't hear my. I started so so so. I started off wanting to sing. My grandma told me earlier, "Oh no, baby, that is not for you." So uh, I'm gonna leave that. I am every woman to Whitney. Um, you know, and I th but but I think that that has a deeper connotation to it, meaning that you can be anything you want to be, right? But you don't 
still understanding that everybody is entitled to their own lives, personal freedom, individuality, and that is okay. But black women are not a monolith. And so, you know, and I can learn different things. We're diverse. We're as diverse as anybody else. So. So I'm trying to think about what I'm going to say. Um, I, I also am not every black woman, um, but I am often in a room where I am the only black woman. Um, in the film industry, it is a primarily white male dominated industry. And so, you know, when I'm mingling with the people, sometimes I do feel the need to speak on behalf of people that sit at the intersections, whether they're black, queer, Southern, um, have limited resources, don't have a college degree. Um, and I think a lot about Ancestor Audre Lorde and how she talks about um, how your silence doesn't protect you. Um, and so sometimes I have to make a choice. Am I gonna say something or am I not? And so I do think that I have practiced nice nasty a lot. I must be honest, like there have been <laughs> seriously times where I have had to tell people about themselves in a way that I still am an honorable woman because I also know that as a black woman, I don't get as many chances. Um, and so I have to be very diligent and serious about what it is that I commit to say. But I do think that it can be challenging. It can be very lonely, uh, but I know that I'm not alone and I do have a community of black women and people who stand by me, support me. And I know that the work matters. And I know that you know, the more I push, the more we all have. And so, you know, but it's, it can be a lot <laughs> sometimes. So yeah, that's probably why I paused a bit. Um, well, let's see, as a performer, a local performer, um, the opportunities, you do have a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, the opportunities can be working as, um, I always say, we're cast as the frame of the big picture. We're not a part of the main story, but we bring a whole to the picture. So um, a lot of the jobs I've had, I would be the only woman of color in the room. And there will be times I can second guess myself and there'll be times where I feel like, okay, you can tell how the role is written. You can tell by the names. It's like, okay, this is what they're expecting because nine times out of 10, it's not a person of color writing the script. It's not a person of color who's producing it. It's not a woman, so they don't know, and they're gonna go with what they think, and they put in three or four different type of characters. You're either uh, young, hot, and sexy, or you're the mama, or you're a uh, woman of the night, if I can put that politely. <laughs> so, and then I found myself second guessing, like, well, which one do I fit in? And I'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's yeah. not my job. My job is to tell the story the way I see it. And if they want to give me a note, they'll give me a note. If I don't get it, it's not for me. You know, so um, I had to learn that. In LA, it was really playing with my mind a lot. Because um, there's also, you're dealing with issues with colorism as well. I said, oh, I don't look this part. I know I don't look this part. And I have to find ways to say, oh, no, 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 no. We come in all shades, shades and colors. And it's, I'm not here to educate you, but I'm here to at least express that this is who we are as a people. <laughs> I don't paint all white people the same. I don't paint all age people the same. So if you can find a window and open it up in a, in a way, because I, I always find myself when I get on a set, I have to find out who's in a good mood today, who's not who I can talk to, who I can be open to. And I'm still finding my way, because a lot of times I feel like I can't s stand up and say things, because I'm not there for the entire picture or the entire show. So I'm finding my way, finding my voice. Because a lot of times they'll ask me, well, what do you think? And I'm like, oh, OK, so you're asking me. <laughs> so yeah. Um, wait, what were I starting from? <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, I just kind of want to piggyback on what you were saying, India, because at first I was like, yeah, Nicole's answer, that sums it all up, but you brought it somewhere else, and then you had me thinking. So, um, 
when I just think about black women in community and, and a lot of times being the only one, um, I found recently how important it is, the sisterhood and making sure that you bring that with you on every project. On Danielle Luna in particular, I wasn't able to have uh, my own producer, my own team. Um, I didn't fight against it just because I didn't know. This is my first time working with, um, uh, uh, with a studio, right? Um, but the production company that I worked with, I found myself, even as a black woman telling a story about a black woman, it wasn't enough. My insight wasn't enough. My experience wasn't enough, right? Um, and no, I'm not every black woman. I'm definitely not Danielle Luna, but I can see her better than these white men who I have to answer to, right? Um, and it really got, it got really hairy, and I think I'm, I'm just getting to a point in my career where I, I know I can't be silent anymore. It just doesn't serve me, it doesn't feel good. Uh, I have to let it out. Um, and it came to a head when I finally let it out, the EP let it out, uh, there was a, a nasty email exchange, whatever, the film came out, it was nice. Um, but <laughs> I will say this, I was sitting, I don't know where this is gonna land, but whatever, it's the truth. Um, I was sitting with some people from the production company the other day, because they're producing something in New Orleans right now, um, and one of the people turned to me and said, you know what, I know you took a lot, but because of your exchange with him, we had a talk with him and he went to therapy and now he's so much better. And I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, I was like, don't y'all owe me a check? A couple of dinners, something. They didn't pay for my dinner that night either, I'm just saying. Um, but I just, I think, I, I, just going back to the experience of black women in this industry, no, we can't be every woman, we shouldn't be because we are not a monolith but we can be each other's biggest cheerleaders. And that's what I've come mm -hmm. into contact with, definitely in the documentary space, definitely in New Orleans film and television space. And these are, all of these ladies are my friends. So mm -hmm. I count myself very blessed. Okay, so you all have been, lived other places, you know, New York, uh, Los Angeles um, places. I wanna talk about the intersection of blackness, womanhood, joy, and survival. And what has been that difference for you all coming from those places and now intersecting in New Orleans? What's been the difference? Wow. I guess um, I lived in New York about nine years straight and back and forth, so equivalent of 13 years. So you can't help but run into artists every second of the day because you're walking. Mm -hmm. walking and so there's always a huge community and one of the most joyous times I had was um, I left and I, mo I went to visit and we went to see support another filmmaker um, uh, film and then afterwards it was just a table of 12 African-American black writers directors um, actors and we were just talking and we were just we weren't we we're talking about the film but other things but that community was just amazing and I just sat there and I'm like oh I love this and LA is different because you got to drive everywhere so people created groups and said we need a support group sometimes we turn into a bitch session and I'm like okay we can't keep bitching the whole time <laughs> you know <laughs> but it was still that you know um here in New Orleans like we all know each other and we all support each other whatever you would tell us what you're doing I'm coming I'm gonna watch you know so I find a community wherever I go Definitely. Um, I think a lot about just taking breaks and getting out into the world. Like sometimes I spend myself, I'm like in meetings, on a computer, in a spreadsheet, like creating a system. And that can get tiring because you're not actually with the people. And so I try to push myself to do more of not only thinking about my own creative work, but being around creative people, being in community. Um, I went to the Black Film Fest of New Orleans event this weekend, and Lakeisha's film and Nicole's film was debut. Well, debuted. It, it debuted. It came out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it premiered, that's the word. Um, and just, you know, taking a break from, from momming and lifing and just being there with people and having a drink and just having music and, and laughing. There was this, like, cool scene about these girls on shrooms. And I was like, yes! <laughs> They're in their drug era, that's so cool, you know? In the, in the, in the, in the film, not in real life. Um, but yeah, you know, just like, you know, just 
having more time to just let go. And I feel like as a black woman, I have seen black women work so hard. And sometimes I pressure myself to work so hard. And I assume that like everybody's watching me and it's 2 p.m. And I could take a break, but I also could do two more things. And so it's just like working on that internal dialogue to give yourself a break and community helps with that. Um, so for me, joy, uh, I believe that we all need to find that joy within, you know? I think that that is important to know who you are, first of all. If you don't know who you are, please do the work. If you gotta go be a monk and live in the forest for a while, I'll just do what you have to do to know who you are at the core. Um, because it can get difficult, the no's, um, dealing with people who think they know more than you or have more access than you and you know they don't. Um, what's going on around us, you know, the the world is literally at war. Um, and so, you know, you have to have that foundation of self and who self is. And in there, understanding what helps you to be joyful and, and how can you be joyful. And so I lived in Los Angeles for four years. And I think that those were four of the actual best years of my life. Um, in hindsight, I moved there thinking that I was gonna be working with a job and I was about to be on and my career was again, was about to be on and popping. Why is this, this is like a recurring theme. Uh, but anyway, it's okay, it's gonna be on and popping one of these days, y'all just watch out, it's coming. It, it, keeps, it keeps almost happening and it's like, oh, not yet, not yet, I'm double dutching, I'm, it's okay though, I'm, I got strong legs, we're gonna keep going. Um, so again, you know, I'm about to blow up and it's like, nope, we went a different direction, but I already moved. <laughs> so it's just like, oh, well, I'm here in LA. So I, I decided like it was either stay in LA and make the best of this time. Um, I manifested living there when I was in high school. My screensaver literally said Hollywood. Um, and so it's like, you could stay or you can go back. And I was like, let me just stay and see what happens. And you know, I learned a lot about myself because if you've ever lived in Los Angeles without a real job, is not easy. Uh, I had to, I did a lot of substitute teaching, um, ride sharing, I did a lot of things. But one of the main things that I had to do was because as a visitor of LA, I always thought it was real superficial. And I was like, I'm not gonna like this. I'm not gonna get along with anybody. However, I had to go out and meet people. And, and I don't wanna use the word networking because it wasn't about a transaction of business. It was literally about meeting genuine people and, and cultivating real, community and relationships. And so it was through there though that my career advanced. It was just about being genuine and building up these genuine relationships and you know, staying true to who I was and not allowing the industry to make me feel like, oh, I gotta become this person or you know, now that I'm here, I gotta go get some, some Botox injections. No offense to anybody who does it. You know, I it got a little lines here. I'm thinking about it myself. But at the time, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like, oh, I had to become someone else to fit into this thing. All I had to do was just be myself and go out and be genuine and meet people. And it was through that that I actually met the right people that I needed to be around in order to create more and more things. And so saying that to say, uh, joy is here. Joy is always here. You can't, you can't get it. Things will make you happy temporarily, you know, things can help you escape from life, but just encouraging all of you uh, to know who you are and know how to create that joy within. Um, I think there's something to be said about the slow burn, Nicole. So it's gonna happen. And when it does happen, it's probably probably gonna appreciate it and care for it more than, you know, we would have when we were younger. Yeah. Um, but I, earlier I said that New Orleans doesn't necessarily inspire my filmmaking, but New Orleans absolutely grounds me because I lived in New York, I lived in LA, I didn't really like LA. You know why? Because I didn't like that the whole town <laughs> was built on my industry. So I felt like I only talked to people in film and television and that was not interesting. Yeah, that's all you about. Right, yeah. right. Was, well, at least that, that was my experience, that was my experience. But I love New York, um, however, there's something about the pace of New Orleans that I think is going to keep me youthful, that yeah. will help me not burn out. Yeah. Wow. Right? There's something about the, there's just something about the work doesn't necessarily drive the city. <laughs> you know, that's not necessarily what's driving us. It's experience, I think, that drives us. And 
that's kind of, I guess that's where the inspirational part of the city kind of works its way into what I'm doing. But it really grounds me and I appreciate the slowness that, that we can have here and it's okay. You don't feel bad about it. You don't feel like you're missing out. It is what it is and we all take mm -hmm. time to party. We yeah. all take time to enjoy our families. Like this is a part of the culture. Um, and so that's what I, and we also, so we also take time to enjoy what makes New Orleans, New Orleans, if, if that makes sense, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really appreciate, appreciative of uh, that experience and just the ease that it kind of gives me in a business that is very uneasy. The oddity of that, in New York, I was always kind of intimidated because people knew their stuff. They know their craft. You don't know your craft, like, oh, uh, uh, look. So it was about the art of, 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 of acting and knowing what you're doing and breaking down scripts and knowing your character. In LA, it was all about aesthetics. So I was intimidated by that. I'm like, oh, I don't look like this. I don't look <laughs> pulled up, like my hair, like what are my clothes? And in New Orleans, it's, it's back and forth for me. Because New Orleans is comfortable, you go in a room, you go into casting and you know everybody. Hey girl, Russ Kiki Key. Like, oh, we here for an audition? Are we going to a party? You know, that's what everybody does in audition. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I gotta focus. Everybody, shh, I gotta focus, focus. We're about to go in a room, y'all. You know, and, and that could be a problem because then you're like, oh, I'm not focused, I'm not in. But at the same time, you're so comfortable. You don't have all of that. So there is a give and take for both. New York, you know, you got that, you're sitting in a room, and you're like, you know, people like, you look good. You're like, oh, look at that resume. Oh. You know, LA, it's all about everyone looks perfect. You know, <laughs> like everyone looks so good. So those are the three different things as far as a performer. I failed to mention New Orleans in my, um, so in coming back to New Orleans, I, I, I think all of these experiences that I can attest to, um, because sometimes Put it this way, the laughing and kiki in and you miss that when you go other places. The community, like I walk to a community book center and laugh and talk with Mama Jen and Mama Vera all day or just, you know, whatever. Like you don't, you don't get that in some places. You can though, because you can cultivate it if you just, it, you gotta work a little extra hard to do so. Um, but I have felt like, okay, people are moving enough for me here. Like it's, you know, the good thing about it is, you know, don't be too bougie for a spirit flight. If you want to go, you know, $49 and you can go somewhere for the weekend, right? And come back. But I do think, as Naila said, that no place has grounded me the way that uh, New Orleans does. And there's culture all around us, culture that people outside of here are always trying to bottle up and sell to someone else. And that's the one thing that we got to remember, too, is that we are here. We are of this of this culture that everybody from around the world, um, going back to the political stuff, I read something today, Jeff Landry was talking about how, you know, you tell somebody in another country or continent to point Louisiana out, and they're gonna be confused, but you say, hey, where is New Orleans? And they're gonna be like, oh, New Orleans is right there. So everybody knows that we are the mecca of art, culture, entertainment, right? We don't always get our due justice here, but just knowing that you are here and everybody's wanting to be and be part of and wishing they could be born in and, and of this here um, is enough to make me appreciate the artistic value it has to my career and, and my evolution. I mean, I do have to say that um, we all know most of these, I would say 99%, they're coming from LA, they're coming from New York. So they have this sort of hierarchy. So they're expecting not to find professionalism. I hear that a lot. But they have to adjust when they're in the room with us because they know people are very comfortable. I hear stories, people going in the room, they talk to you like, they'll talk to, you know, like someone like Rob Reiner, like they're their uncle, hey, uncle, you know, and he, he just has to adjust, you know. Um, but then if you really prove to them, I know what I'm doing, then they change your tune, you know. Okay. 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 So before we shift the question, I have to ask. I, this question is for you as women. Um, I know we see the awards and the traveling, you know, but as black women in this business, because it, it takes a little 
a lot from us. What do you do for self-care for yourself? Um, I go to the bayou. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've become the bayou lady. Yeah. Everybody sees me at the bayou. That's my therapy. I need the water. I, don't, I have the, that's why I love New York over, well, I love California, but I don't always at the river. It's, mm -hmm. it's something about the water for me. Um, I think I meditate. I do that a lot more now than I did before. I make sure I have time to myself in the morning. Like, don't call me before nine or don't expect a response probably before 10. It's, yeah. it's that's my time. It's not going to happen. Um, so there are things like that. But then I also make sure that um, I kind of don't define myself by the work uh, because one day it may go, one day it may shift. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think right now I'm walking in the purpose that I'm supposed to walk in, but what if that changes? Like, will I be okay with that? Or am I holding on to it because I'm known for this or this brought me some type of award or this and that? Um, so I think just continuing to, and I mean, this isn't like a self-care routine, but just um, staying connected with like myself and asking the questions and and who am I serving in this in this space? Because I think that's a lot of the work that I do too is service and not so much about propping myself up. Um, and then I think that makes it easier if one day this all goes away because then I could just shift the service to some other way. I think there's like a variety of things that I do, but the first thing that I do is just pay attention and be aware to what I need and be flexible. Um, I take off of work and I don't talk to people and I hide and um, go into a space where I can do all my things. I write, I love being outside. The elements, if I can be by the water, the wind, the, the ground and the, what's the other one? The sun. <laughs> So, so the beach or by the lake, you know, all of that is going to feel good to me and, and, and inspire me. Um, sometimes just getting in the streets a little bit at night, you know, just it's something about being at night at outside at night that just is good for me. Um, but yeah, just also just saying no and boundary setting. I have just gotten so good at creating boundaries and being like, actually, that doesn't work for me. Um, I'm also OK with not responding to people um, now. Um, and so, yeah, I just I just don't have to. And I tell myself that. And then just affirmation, words of affirmation. I save them. I read them again. If you ever say a nice word to me, trust me, I'll always remember. Um, and but I do that to myself. It's written on my mirror. I'm saying it. Um, so yeah, it's a it's just a variety of things. It's not just one thing that I can do to take care of myself. I have to do a lot of different things. Well, in addition to everything uh, and baths, uh, that's also another thing that I do. Um, I try to watch my scrolling on social media, and I try to curate my social media. For some reason, Instagram and Facebook keeps wanting to show me crap, but I don't know why. I keep liking all of the good affirmation things, and the you know, and, and every now and then I'll get some weird. Uh, but I, I do feel like you know we feed. We don't just nourish our bodies and feed through what we eat. You know, our mind, our ears, all of this we're intaking, and so I feel like uh, it's very important to just watch your scrolling as well. All right. Well, I like to now open it up to the audience if you have questions. Well, until someone thinks of a question, I have another one. <laughs> um, do you find it your responsibility? If so, what do you do to teach the younger black youth that are interested in this um, industry? Well, um, I think it's very important to, to teach our youth. Uh, I have a, a daughter. She'll be 13 and in exactly a month. Um, and I think about uh, not just her, but girls like her. I think about me when I was younger and, and who I had around me. And um, I also used to substitute teach. And so I think about the girls in the classrooms. And I just think about the access and, and what it means to cultivate the next generation of, of young voices. And so um, it's very important because a lot of girls are being told what they can't do and not necessarily what they can do. Um, a lot of girls still in 2024 are being uh, police fetishized, all the things. And so I think it's important for us to step in 
and and be the big sisters, uh, role models for these young girls. Um, actually, next week, uh, Lakeisha and I, we have a, a workshop for young girls. It's a public speaking workshop um, where we take girls 11 to 17 and we go through three uh, Saturdays for public speaking and just helping them to gain confidence through that because so many times, young girls, young people will feel like they're not worthy of their voices being heard. They don't have someone to believe in them to help them cultivate their ideas and thoughts. And they don't necessarily feel confident enough to voice what they're thinking and their contributions to the world. So we wanna make sure that that's no, no, no more. And so that's what we're working on actually as far as the youth is concerned. But yes, mentor, very important. Um, I think about this twofold in terms of my staff and in terms of trainees who take training at Novak. Um, it, it reminded me of something you said, Donna. It's, we do this training called Navigating Challenging Situations, where we're teaching people how to work on set with a big crew of people who you may only be working with for three months, um, and how to, how to speak to them about challenging things. We used to have people who would come in and facilitate our training and they had this mindset almost like shut up and dribble, like be grateful that you have a job. It's hard to get a job out here. Like people hire their friends, like be nice and be happy and just do anything that's asked of you. And I think that's very um, problematic. Um, I think that um, people have experienced racism and sexism on set and a lot of times people don't know who they can talk to and they feel like because everybody has to like you to get the next job, it's contract culture, it's gig culture. You're going from a show to a, a limited series to a movie, you know, all in a year, you might've had six jobs with a different crew each time. Um, so we really empower people and practice having conversations where people, where we put a scenario in front of folks and we model what having that conversation could look like. And we also model thinking through, is this a conversation I feel safe enough to have? Okay, here's what I can do if I feel safe and here's when I could do it and here's how I can ask them to have a talk. Um, or do I not feel safe? And if I don't feel safe, then it's probably an ism in there. It's probably racism, sexism, um, maybe you're homophobic. And so I, I probably shouldn't have that conversation with you. So here's how I go to like HR, or who, here's how Novak could help me. Um, and we've had to help people navigate challenging situations and like sit down with the supervisor or whoever because they just were wrong and people need that support. And so I hope that folks who work in the film industry continue to find the courage to speak up because um, people of color, people that sit at various intersections have, have, have been oppressed in the system plenty of times. Um, and speaking up is important in changing that. And that's one thing that people can do you know, time after time. Um, and then the other thing is I think about my staff. Um, I just want to empower my staff. I have some like phenomenal people who work on my team who do so much for the culture of film and I've seen them be um, spread thin. And so I try to teach people how to think about their time as an asset and a value and how to um, just not give so much away, especially for free. <laughs> you know, like you deserve to be um, you deserve reciprocity for your time and um, you do so much and you deserve at least acknowledgement. So like really talking through helping people to create boundaries and also just like make, um, like, make, like make people meet the bar and not just accept anything for your work and your time. Um, I would say accept that this is not a sprint. This is an ongoing marathon. It just, this is gonna be roller coasters throughout your entire career. You think you may have made it. I've had phone calls with friends who are on TV shows and they're like, I don't feel like I'm an actor. I have to take acting classes because I'm just sitting here reacting. I said, but, she said, but I have a job. Just accepting that, you know, and appreciating the work. Um, be in tune with your senses, especially listening. That's something I learned with William Esper. It was about learning to listen and observing the room and understanding your environment. Those are the key things that I always say. Watch your environment, see who's on set, who's important, educating yourself. Specifically, if you don't know what you're doing, go back to school, which is what I did. I got my college degree and I was like, I still don't know what I'm doing. So that's why I went to William Esper and was more specific in learning a technique on how to, uh, uh, to approach work and understanding that. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Um, 
well, first I want to say, Nicole, bravo, Nicole and Nikisha, the work that you're doing, because I was that little girl who never wanted to stand up and speak in public. I think it's probably the last 10 years since having to promote films and things like that, that I've become a bit more uh, comfortable because it's a part of the work, right? Um, and then India, I mean, I have been in those situations where, and I, I, I think about this as a director, I never want anybody to have a bad day on set because of me. And a lot of that behavior and the toxicity on sets is top down, right? Um, it's the directors, it's the ADs, it's the producers, whoever. Um, but so again, bravo to y'all for just the work that you're doing because I know how important and necessary it is. Um, and the, the toxicity, the abuse really in our industry is pervasive and it's also just accepted, right? And, and they do say you should be grateful you're here, especially as probably the only black person or one of a few on set. Um, I do feel like that was kind of my experience um, with Luna. It came through a diver diversity initiative and when we would push, I think sometimes the responses were like, sit down and shut up. Like, be happy that, you know, we got this done for you. And we fought really hard to make it a great film. But, and that, so when I say that, that speaks more to kind of the promotion and marketing of the film. Um, because I still, to this day, believe Danielle Luna deserved more. But um, when it comes to young women who want to get in the field, I want to just always be accessible. I didn't know any black women directors growing up. And I won't say that made me think I couldn't do it, but it just didn't even put the idea in my head. I didn't even, you know, it was not It was never a thought. Um, and so whenever I meet young women, they ask for my number or my email or my IG, I'm like, sure, like, get in touch with me. Let's, we can talk, we can have lunch. I'd be trying to save my little coins. They always want to eat somewhere expensive. <laughs> Um, and you know, I feel like I'm the adult here. I have to pay for lunch. I want to make this an experience. Make them think I'm so, <laughs> right? Make them think, make them think this is a worthwhile industry to be in. No, but um, but I just try and make that space and make myself accessible. And so hopefully they'll do that um, for the next generation coming up because I think that's what's important. A lot of us can't be pioneers, but we need to see it in order to believe it for ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's important. Yeah, I've got a question. Can I? How do you navigate largely white or all white rooms where you're the only? How do you how do you deal with that? Large right room. Mm. Um, I kind of go into every room, and I know everyone is different. I go into every room, kind of not, kind of not thinking about it. Like your whiteness is your problem. I don't really think I need to explain. No real talk. I don't think I really need to explain my blackness or my point of view. Like you don't come into the room explaining your whiteness to me. I don't feel like I offer, I need to offer you or over explain anything. I'm just telling you what it is. This is, this is a story. This is how we should do it. Um, you know, I have a talent. I, I, I know I'm a good storyteller. I know I, you know, I can lead this production. Um, so for me, I don't even, I try not to let it get to me until like, you know, it becomes a problem. And then I'm like, uh, okay. And then I ask myself, is this what I, this one I wanna do? Is this a space that I wanna be in? Are these people that I want uh, to be working with for at least two years? It's gonna be at least, at the very least two years. So um, that's, that's kind of how I handle it. It's, it's not my problem. <laughs> uh, I say ditto, I don't really, Unless it becomes a problem and an issue, I'll speak up. Otherwise, I don't even think about it. Right. Just do the work. <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> I brace myself. <laughs> um, but I like that it's not my problem uh, vibe. I like that. I'm going I'm to hold on to that. I, you know, what I like to do is fascinate myself with how I notice how I fascinate others. Um, it's interesting to me sometimes when I can see the microaggressions happen or see people not expect me to be smart or understand or have something to say or lean on me so much to say. Um, so I just notice it and it doesn't, it doesn't always go past me. Um, and then I just, I find space. I talked about this in therapy one time. My therapist was like, how do you like, get stuff off of you like how do you let go of energy so that's kind of what I have to do is just 
find a way to let the energy go and then go back into my my safe space if it was a situation that didn't make me feel good or if it just felt like too much pressure. But I, I do notice it. Um, yep. Yeah. I think I'm learning how to not notice it. And I think the only reason why I do notice it is because um, growing up, uh, my K through 12, I was the only one of four or five, if not the only black child in my school setting. And so um, growing up, you know, uh, some of my friends in those spaces were real comfortable letting me know about the thoughts and conversations that happened in their homes. Um, I learned about jokes that were being told uh, as if I wasn't a black girl just in the classroom. And so I think that that experience always makes me think, well, are these the whites that make those types of jokes or are these not the whites that make those types of jokes? And so I'm learning how to just go into a space without the, that, I don't know if that's trauma, but just that in the back of my brain about knowing the people that I grew up with in, in their families. Um, because you know, all white people are not the same. And so it's not fair. Uh, for me to go in spaces and, and, and putting that on them as well. I will say this too, um, I've been in more spaces though where I've been the only black girl, woman, or person where um, I've had white people express some type of guilt to me in different forms or fashions. And that doesn't have to happen either. Uh, just because I'm black in the room, um, you don't have to try to come and bond with me over telling me like, yeah, I hear that, you know, Beyonce has a new hairline in it. Does it work with your 4C type? Or, or like, you know, or like, I'm sorry that this happened. And it's like, yeah, I too. So, yeah, you know, it, we can just have a regular conversation. It doesn't have to be, you know, it, it happens a lot where it's like the guilt comes out and it's like, wait, that's, you don't have to hold on to that. It's okay. I'm not looking at you like that. We're all good. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think showing up as the only black person in spaces can happen. Can, can manifest in different ways. So just putting that out there. I just want to, um, just like a, a quick story. I'm, I was on working on a big set as a dancer. Basically it was like, I didn't realize it was an extra, but I realized, <laughs> I was like, whatever, I want to dance. So the costume designer, she was from LA, she was huge, but she was so insulting. She insulted me so bad that I, the only time I ever became that unprofessional on set, I lost my mind. And then I heard later on she was insulting the other people and they were telling me they didn't know. So I went to the set while I was shooting. I said, uh, first AD, get over here. And I told her, I said, I'm gonna make all these people walk off set with every costume. And her eyes got big. I said, change the tune. I said, I'm not having it. I didn't care who these people were. I knew my worth. I said, I'll never work again. I don't care. I said, I'm not gonna take this disrespect. So I do say I, I will notice it. If it's overt, I will say something mm -hmm. and I don't care. You know. <laughs> Any more questions from audience? Yes. Um, I think with that question, I'm curious to know what gives you the courage in those times where you feel like you can't bring your whole self, whether it's emotionally or culturally in any way as yourself and as a black woman into whatever space and opportunity, what is giving you that courage to actually realize and say that, no, this might not be something I want to do or I need to make those changes to be comfortable in this and try to continue. Um, it, it was, I worked on a, a TV show of HBO. I got called at the last minute, which I hate. I can't say that as a compliment, but I walked in and it was not working and it was all men. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm freaking out. It's all men. And the two main stars, they were improv and I'm playing a doctor and I have all this jargon, medical jargon, I'm like, I can't fit in here. So the main star is rolling his eyes and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit. I quit acting, I'm done. The director's in my face, the writer's in my face. I, I said, you know what, time. I said, get that grip over there and get him on set because I'm not doing this. I told him that, he said, no, calm down. I'm like, nope, I said, I'm not doing this. I said, they're improv what do you want me to do? I, you know, I, that was the one time I really thought I was quitting acting, I was done. I said, I'm, I'm not gonna deal with this. The testosterone really got to me. <laughs> it got to me. I just think that some, I'm scared a lot. And you know, they say that if something 
um, what what is it like how fear can be a tool? So I lean into fear. Um, I, I don't know a lot of things. And so I feel like I'm learning something all the time. And so if I ever just reflect and look at everything that I've been able to accomplish, I'm like, well, girl, you're doing it. So just keep doing it. And you know how people say, you know, um, everybody doesn't know what they're doing. I think that that is true in a lot of ways. There are so many people who just have the audacity to do something. And I'm just like, well, girl, you can do. Mm -hmm. And I just do it and I just try and I just keep doing it. So um, I think it, you have to have a level of confidence and belief in yourself. I have a level of faith. I know that if it ain't me showing up, then the creator, some ancestors, my grandma and them, you know, who on the other side, they gonna look out at the end of the day. So. I'm gonna just go for it if I if I think that I can. And sometimes it takes a push from your people and I appreciate those those pushes too. You are a great executive director of Novak. I think that oh, you are. My board president. <laughs> I am, but, but you're great at that. Now I'm the opposite. Um, sometimes I have a little bit too much audacity and impulsivity. And sometimes I can go on the, like the, so I actually have to, in those moments, it's not about how do I have the courage. Sometimes I'm mighty dog. I'm just like, let me at him, let me at him. And I have to be like, wait a minute, you need to breathe. You need to pause. <laughs> you need to make sure that first of all, what's happening in front of you is actually happening. And then you need to think about what is the most intelligent way to navigate this issue or problem. Because sometimes it's not just about checking a person. Um, it's about, you know, the consequences that happen afterwards. It's also about making sure that things change beyond that moment. And sometimes that takes, you know, an email or getting other people involved. And sometimes when you react too aggressively too soon, um, and this has nothing to do with being a black woman. It's just a personal thing that I know and take ownership of. Um, it's about being intelligent in those spaces. And so I think to that navigating those spaces takes confidence and courage, but it also takes um, understanding. It takes breath work, it takes resolve, it takes intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence, because um, if you want things to truly be different and change, it's gonna be go beyond that moment, you know? And so per earlier and per our discussion, and you know, it, it has to, it does, because you need to make sure that everybody understands and everybody's on the same page about what you're willing to tolerate and what you're not willing to tolerate. But sometimes if you go full throttle, you know, it's, it's harder to get to, to what you want. I do know on a lot of film sets, a lot of people are flying by the seat of their pants. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> From the director to the producer, I don't know what's going on. Crew people don't even know what's the name of this movie. They don't know. They're flying by the seat of their pants. And I'm like, well, you don't know. What am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? It happens a lot. Yeah, it's, I feel like people are afraid and self-conscious, and no one wants to look like the person that doesn't know what's going on, right? Uh, and that's where a lot of that meanness comes in. But for me, I think I'm able now to set boundaries because if I don't, I know the damage that it has done to me personally. Um, and so it's not because I'm super brave or I'm audacious. I just know I'm not gonna survive this thing if I do not stand up for myself. Um, I've definitely experienced burnout. I've definitely experienced shame for not speaking up for myself in certain moments. And um, that just doesn't serve me. And so again, even to go back to the going into a room where I'm the only black person, it's not that I don't see that they're white. I just can't take that on. I can't take on that burden. And so I have to say, I do not care. Like I have to show up the way that I am um, because it's just, it's just too hard otherwise. Uh, and so that's what I've really learned in this industry, no matter, I'm not code switching. Um, I'm not, you know, trying to lessen, I don't think I have a huge New Orleans accent, probably around like my New Orleans people is thicker, but um, I'm not changing any of that. Like you, because it's just, it's too hard. Um, and so, and even the saying yes to things that I know I don't want to do, I just can't do it anymore. Well, you have another question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's been amazing uh, learning from you and with you. Uh, I'm thinking about um, 
the relationship between cultural and planetary health and wondering how our climate change is impacting your work and your lives and your creative expression. Just wondering how much that's on your mind or how, how that relates to the projects that you're part of or that you envision. Um, and, and, and trying to um, like not divorce creative work from, from climate change realities and look for, and like how we look for ways to integrate reality-based thinking about the future of this place. Yeah, I can't say that I have any uh, specific strategies in mind, but I do think about it a lot as far as New Orleans and how long we'll be here, how long, you know, um, just, yeah, that's really, when I think about the future of New Orleans and uh, the filmmaking community and how long we can sustain in a place that, you know, we're going to have hurricanes, we have uh, severe land loss, rapid land loss, things like that. Um, and then the, what are practices that I can put in personally to make sure that I am not um, exacerbating the issue um, as best I can? I thought about that when we were making plaque amends and just kind of like the recycling and reuse and upcycling of things. Um, I tried, but I feel like going forward, I need to make a more concerted effort. Um, yeah, it, it is tough, but it is something to be mindful of. Um, and one thing I can say um, is that Vanishing Pearls was released in 2014. Um, March 3rd or 4th, my contract with my distributor ends. And um, right now, all you the only place you can find it is, is on a JetBlue flight. So, you know, we can do more. So once that contract is over, I'm going to make sure that we stream on more platforms because I think that's a story that, um, that people need to hear. It's very much about uh, land loss. It's about the loss of legacy. Um, and all of this is because of the worst environmental disaster that happened um, in our history. And so uh, as far as thinking about environmentalism, that's kind of where I, where I land. Um, I guess if you're, you know, it's an inconsistent business. So I look at it in the standpoint as far as work. Because um, in New Orleans, we don't have a lot of work in August to September, September specifically, because insurance goes up because of hurricane season. So you're like, I got a whole month where there's really going to be nothing here. L.A. is starting to deal with a lot of it. The weather is really bad right now. So I'm wondering, like, are they going to start shifting? Um, New York is starting to get bad weather. During the winter, there's less work. So, but they have theater. So people go to theater. Oh, I'm going to go to theater, you know. But here in New Orleans, like, this whole year has been bad. It's been with the strike. It's been really bad. But they also don't work. You got all the Mardi Gras. You got New Year's, so they don't want to work here. So you know you have four or five months where nothing's going to be here. So you've got to consistently be looking for work elsewhere, you know. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to environment, I think about it a lot. Like you said, like, how long are we going to be here? Because... Producers think about this stuff because they did emancipation during summer. And I'm like, how in the hell did they do it? They were dying. I mean, they were wearing like heavy clothes and it was like 100 degrees outside. People were passing out. It was crazy. So they, they say the summers are bad. So, yeah. Uh, Novak did a series called Post Coastal years ago, and it talks about... Um, things people are doing to just like preserve the environment. And so you can go to novakvideo.org and watch a series of documentaries about local people doing stuff to support the environment. Um, I know that some production companies, studios, what have you, have things in place to to recycle and reuse things. They have now um, eco, like, like they have eco set PAs who like, their whole job is to make sure that the they're not wasteful, uh, you know, like water bottles, because everybody's fed on set multiple times a day, for example. So water bottles, paper plates, all of those things are just creating waste. So um, I know that studios are being more thoughtful about uh, what they can do to preserve. And I know that folks do a lot to like, like uh, reuse furniture, reuse costumes, like you said, upcycling instead of, um, throwing things away, giving them away, donating them to nonprofits if they're not going to use the costumes or what have you. And um, I feel like a lot of independent filmmakers think about sustainability because they're working with limited resources anyway. So mm -hmm. actors are bringing their own things. You're borrowing a couch from your grandma. You know, you're just making it work. 
Um, but on a personal tip, sometimes I lose sleep over it. I'm like, are we recycling? Can more people be composting? Like, I do feel like this city needs to take a bigger push to be more sustainable. Like if you go to Vermont or somewhere else, you know, it's mandated that you um, are less wasteful. And so even after Mardi Gras, I appreciated seeing like the library be like, give me your throws. Like, I don't want all that stuff, you know? I want some of it now, but what I'm gonna do with all of it, I don't wanna throw it away though. So just, I feel like personally, we all need to think of more ways to, to waste less um, as one of the ways to protect the environment. I know there are lots of things we can't control, like the sun and how hot it is in the summer. It's depressing a little bit. August and September felt like a winter depression. It was like summer depression. I'm like, what do I do? I'm stuck in the house, it's not. It was so hard. No, I mean, that's why I was going to talk about more of the mental and physical aspects of uh, of what's happening. I mean, we had forest fires in a marsh in a bayou. Um, we had to call in firefighters from outside of the state to, to put it out because we didn't know how to, to, to properly do this. And so just the physical and mental health that uh, what's happening has on us as even creators, but just as people and human beings, you know? We can't eat our crawfish like we want to because of, you know, <laughs> climate change. And because it's, 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 you know, not a pound. Right, exactly, but that's, but, but that's due to nature and weather and because of the, the extremes in weather. Um, just thinking about the things that give us joy and, and, and help us to be uh, part of our culture. You know, you can't go outside when it's 105 degrees, you'll pass out. You know, and, and when it freezes here, we shut down. So, you know, just things like that. Um, but as a filmmaker, I do, I like to have as green of a set as I can. Um, I do like to recycle, I'm not gonna lie. I have a recycling bin outside and people who walk by my street throw trash in there and it makes me so mad. Um, and I'm not about to go in and take it out either. I just get over it. Um, but I do try my best to be uh, as green as possible. And I think it's important because we only have one earth and, and we take care of her, she'll take care of us. But you know, that's why we have all this stuff happening because I think we're not taking care of her right, but that's a whole nother rant. Well, I would like to say thank you. And I'm very honored to have been sitting up here with you ladies and to know some of you all and to get to know you all. And uh, just give them a round of applause. Thank you. I want to thank Lakeisha Glover. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank Dr. Rebecca Snedeker. I want to thank everybody at New Orleans Gulf South. I would like to thank the Department of Theater and Dance and Tulane University. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.